once they arrive. So, okay, uh, welcome to the training. It's, it's Friday, February 26th. Today is here. We have been looking forward to this training for such a long time. Uh, I'm Carrie Worthington. I'm with the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. And uh, today I will um, help guide you through your training. So we'll just move to the next slide. As people are still signing on, we are, um, we'll just give you a moment to orient yourself to the Zoom meeting platform. So we'll be using this training uh, throughout the next couple of trainings and especially for the last training that my coworker colleague uh, Lisa will get to. Uh, but we really want to make sure that you're comfortable participating. So uh, during the Q&A, we, we will open it up uh, for audience members to participate by video. And uh, as part of that, we are not going to uh, post a public recording with the Q&A. So this is really your training. So please um, take a moment to get familiar with how to interact with us because we want to make sure that we answer your questions today. So we can move to the next slide. Thanks. So welcome to the first part of a three-part webinar training series for the Western States on Integrated Distribution Systems Planning. Under the U.S. Department of Energy's Grid Modernization Laboratory Consortium, National Energy Laboratories partner with the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners and the National Association of State Energy Offices, uh, excuse me, officials to provide training sessions to public utility commissions and state energy offices across the country. Working in collaboration with the Western Inter Interstate Energy Board, our regional co-host, we are returning to the West following up from a training in 2018. Today, our topic is integration, management, and control of distributed energy resources. If you are registered for today's session, you are registered for all of the training sessions. And I hope that you will join us again on Friday, March 5th for the training on planning for grid modernization and resilience and investment economics. And then two Fridays from then, on the 19th, we will have a training on planning for energy storage. At this time, I will uh, invite Lisa to uh, give us a few updates on how this training is a little bit different than the, the May training. We've, we've added some new features. Uh, Lisa, take it away. Thanks, Carrie. I'm Lisa Schwartz at Berkeley Lab. It's my pleasure to lead this national training effort for the labs on integrated distribution system planning. Our sister lab, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, is partnering with us for this particular Western training series. And of course, thanks to the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Electricity and Building Technologies Office for supporting our work for our training today on integration, management, and control of distributed energy resources. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions, as Carrie said, at the end of the training after both presenters uh, are, are through. Um, I'm very excited uh, to say that if you have additional questions, we're offering something new, and my Western home region is the proving ground. All of the trainers for this webinar series have kindly agreed to make themselves available for office hours. You will have an opportunity to sign up for an office hours appointment with one or more of the trainers, and I encourage you to do that. They can provide information and resources that can be helpful for policies, regulations, and programs for your state. We'll include the links to sign up for office hours with today's trainers in the chat box. Uh, Dominic uh, will drop that into the chat box for us or Carrie and see the participants guide that NARIC sent you for more information. And then after this three part training series is complete, we'll host a round table with the Inter Western Interstate Energy Board and our partners NARIC and NASIO and Pacific Northwest Lab where state energy leaders, commissioners and state energy office directors and consumer advocates will discuss policy and regulatory issues related to utility investments in grid modernization. And we have three panels for you. The first one will be moderated by Maury Galbraith, director of WEEB, Changes in Regulatory Approaches and Utility Business Models. Uh, oh, sorry, that's mine. <laughs> uh, the second uh, panel will be moderated by Maury's Investment Economics, Approaches for Cost Benefit Analysis of Utility Investments in Grid Modernization. And Juliet Homer with Pacific Northwest National Lab will moderate a panel on electrification. So please stay tuned for more information, including the date and time. That'd be terrific, uh, likely late March or early April. 
Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Kirsten um, from NASIO to introduce Commissioner McAllister. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. NASIO is very excited um, to partner with NARUG and the Berkeley Lab on this webinar training series for Western States Integrated Re Distribution System Planning. It's my particular pleasure to introduce you to Commissioner Andrew McAllister to kick us off. Commissioner McAllister is serving his second term on the California Energy Commission, where he leads the policy areas of energy efficiency and energy assessments. He's focused on enabling modern data-rich analytical tools to support strong clean energy policies. Commissioner McAllister has worked on energy deployment and policy since the early 1990s, and he's worked across the world to deploy clean, cost-effective energy solutions with counterparts ranging from very small remote communities to the largest of utilities. He's the immediate past chair of the board of directors of NASIO and a board member of the Alliance to Safe Energy. His deep grounding in technology policy in the marketplace provides him with great insights on the accelerating changes taking place in California. Um, and I'm very excited that he will share these insights with us today. Andrew, the floor is yours. Andrew, we can't hear you. Commissioner McAllister, are you there? I am. Okay, we can hear you. We can't see you, but that's okay. We can hear you. Uh, would you like to uh, say a few words about your perspective at the state level on the distribution systems integrated planning? Okay, we will we will work on this and come come back. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to just keep going. Um, so I will review the agenda and then we'll, we'll see if we can circle back to Commissioner McAllister. Uh, so Dominic, could you please pull up the agenda? So uh, we went through some of the welcome and introduction. So uh, I will introduce the speakers today in just a moment, but we are, um, I just wanted to re reiterate and go through a little bit more about the Q&A. Uh, we are taking questions over chat. So please uh, text me. Uh, my name here is Ask Me Carrie from Nehruk. And uh, please chat me with your questions. Uh, you can also send, uh, you can chit chat over the chat box for everyone so that everyone on the training sees what you are saying. Uh, that's okay too. Uh, but we will, um, I, I'm communicating with Lisa off, off, uh, off of Zoom to uh, develop some questions for her to moderate at the end. So um, as I mentioned, we are recording this training. We are recording the Q&A, but the, um, that is really just for internal purposes and the public, um, the public recording that we will post on our YouTube will not include the Q&A. So we do encourage you to just um, to engage with us and make sure that you know how to use the chat and other functions to be able to participate. Of course, you can always email me. Um, so uh, no worries with that. So, um, We'll keep going. So after the training, please um, take a moment to give us your feedback through the evaluations. I just wanted to give you a few reasons why these evaluations are so important to us. We were able to take the evaluations from previous trainings and uh, justify our costs, work with our partners, inform what we do. So um, if you liked today, we do need to hear that. And if you didn't like today, we want to know what we can do to make it better or uh, where we fall, fell short of your expectations. Um, so, um, if you need any other reason to fill out the evaluation, just let me know, of course, but uh, please do take a few moments at the end of the training uh, while it's so fresh and we'll get you a, an email with the link, but all of your information is really included in the, the participant guide. Uh, we, we were pretty thorough with including all of the links, so most of your FAQs are going to be in there. 
So let me see if I can circle back with. Um, be curious, Lisa, I'm not, I don't think that Commissioner okay. McAllister is on the line. There's a different McAllister um, who's participating uh, unless we hear right now from Commissioner McAllister. So I think we should proceed to our first speaker if you want to introduce Patrick. Great. Okay. Sorry about the confusion, everyone. Um, and hi, um, non-Commissioner McAllister. Sorry for the confusion there for you. Um, uh, so we have great speakers today. Um, I've, I've heard um, Mr. Patrick Dalton speak. He's uh, he's very even toned and it's um, and he's very thorough with. Uh, w with his understanding of how this applies to what uh, you all have to do. So Mr. Patrick Dalton is with ICF Consulting. He has over a decade of experience with distribution engineering and has specific expertise with implementation of inverter-based resources and has uh, personally assisted Minnesota in updating their statewide interconnection process and technical standards. We have another very esteemed panelist, uh, Ms. Mary Ann Piet, and she has a background in mechanical and building engineering and is currently the senior scientist and director of the building technology and urban systems division at Berkeley Labs. She has a host of experience with demand response and leads the building energy research activities with DOE. Without further ado, I will pass it off to Patrick who we did a tech check before, so he should be on. Great, thank you, Carrie, and uh, thank you, Nehra. NASIO, DOE, all, all the sponsors of, of this event. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all on, on this topic. And what I'm going to be covering is the supply side DER, so sources of, of energy. And then Marianne in the, the next presentation is going to be looking a little bit more at the, the load side. So with that, uh, next slide, please. All right, so just starting with the key takeaways in mind here. Um, first, we're going to just briefly talk about how DER integration considerations vary by technology type. We're really moving into inverter-based world, so that will be the focus of the rest of the presentation largely, but just want to acknowledge some of the differences up front. Then we're going to talk about some of the, the impacts, DER impacts that grid planners and modelers review as we're thinking about integrating DER into the system. So we'll look at a framework for that. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how the operational planning market integration needs are, are evolving, uh, thinking about some of the, the monitoring and control associated with integrating energy storage or DER aggregations. It's, it's really a, a changing world for DER on the, the market front, and, and that matters with for how we integrate DER into the system. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the control size. So DER can have DER does have local controls, but it can also be controlled from centralized systems. And that becomes increasingly important as we get higher penetrations and, and think about really integrating DER as a essential resource on the, the system. And then we'll end with interoperability, which is, is really the, the grouping of topics around communications and information exchange. And so we'll, we'll talk about how that's important for monitoring and, and control. Next slide, please. So next, please, we're going to start with a brief overview of, of the technologies. So I, I mentioned that the impacts matter based on the technology type. And in the past, a lot of DER was, was rotating machines going back a number of, of decades. And, and this was a very mechanically coupled type of DER that the response was based on, on the physics of the magnetic fields and sort of just what's going on in that machine. And as we move into this inverter-based world, these DER are really defined, the responses are defined by software. So that opens up a great deal of flexibility, but it also opens up a greater range of responses when there's an issue on the system, for example, exactly how the DER responds. If it's a, a solar site, that inverter and the specific kind of programming of it 
is going to dictate the re response. So it's sort of a wider range of, of responses um, and capabilities for, for that matter. And so most inverters aren't designed to operate without the larger grid. They're often called grid following, but grid forming is becoming an increasingly important topic as we think about microgrids and inverters and DER to really support the, the system as inverters become the dominant type of, of generation, both on the distribution side and on the bulk system side. Next slide, please. So this is uh, an image of the, the inverter controls. We're not going to get into the, the technical details, but what I did want to point out from this slide is that an inverter is taking the, the direct current from a solar panel and really chopping up that energy into a waveform that mimics the grid and, and basically just follows the grid. And, and this is that software defined response where an inverter is just looking to inject energy into the grid based on the signal that the grid is, is giving. That's the, the model of inverters for DER in grid connected mode that we see going on the, the system today. Next slide, please. When we think of energy storage, um, okay, there, there was a, something I want to say about energy storage before we, we move on in, in that energy storage has another layer of software controls on top of those inverter controls that, that we were, were just looking at. And that opens up another range of, of capabilities and responses that we won't go into as much detail on today, but just wanted to mention that. So next slide, please. So in terms of a, a framework for how sometimes how I think about the progression for integrating DER, there's first just the foundational DER interconnection. So plugging a device into the, the system is kind of the interconnection side of things. And the, the constraints that grid planners and operators look at when doing an interconnection often fall into four categories of voltage, thermal control and protection considerations. We're going to spend a little time looking at the voltage considerations because that's where smart inverters based on IEEE 1547, which is opening up smart inverters to a, a much broader market here. That's what, what these inverters can control and, and really support the, the grid. And then there's kind of going up a layer, there's the DER planning and operational needs. So thinking about more of a systems perspective in terms of what do we need to be aware of, of how DER is behaving as we, we operate the grid. Um, if it's masking a portion of load and we need to make sure that we have an ability to serve that, that load, it needs to be that sort of awareness from a planning perspective. We might need to start to have more remote control in order to keep DER online and part of the system in a wider range of, of conditions. And then there's this bulk system reliability perspective. You might hear terms like ride through, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, how DER is becoming much more critical for supporting the bulk system. And it, it can have a meaningful impact on the bulk system if it all goes away suddenly in some sort of mass tripping event. So we need to, to think of kind of that higher level beyond the distribution system perspective as we're, we're integrating DER. Going one step further, there's thinking of DER as an integrated resource that can provide capacity um, services, you know, maybe as an alternative to upgrading a, a substation transformer in, in this kind of non-wires alternative scenario. And then there's also the market side, um, kind of opening up a broader range of, of services. So next slide, please. I'm going to briefly go over sort of DER impacts 
on the, the system. So this is what we're looking at is a, a kind of standard load only voltage profile. And that's a chart on the bottom, whereas you go further away from the substation in a typical system, the voltage declines. Next. But as we install DER on the system, this reverse flow can cause the voltage to rise near where that, that DER is located. So it's really a function of that reverse power flow and that same effect that was causing the declining voltage in the previous scenario is now causing an elevated voltage near the, the DER. Next. And so there's, there's really two main ways from the, the DER perspective that it can, the DER can help to manage voltage. Next. The, the first is consuming reactive power. So there's a component of power called um, reactive power or VARS is the unit that it's measured in. And if a, a DER is consuming that type of power to sort of counteract the, the effects of the, the watts that it's injecting into the, the system, that can have a meaningful impact. And that's the basis of a, the smart inverter functions at, from a, a fundamental level. Next. The other way, which is a little bit less desirable, is to reduce the watts, so a, a lower degree of energy production at that time. And that's generally reserved as sort of a backup option because it affects the, the economics of the, the DER. And if the system is counting on this energy, it's important to try to not curtail uh, that energy production unless it's absolutely necessary. Next, please. So then on the, the situational awareness front, there's, there's an, a need to be aware of where DER is connected and the amount that's, that's being produced. And this is just a, a brief example that we'll walk through where this, this large solar plant is being served near a, a substation to start with. And we sort of, in this situation, it's been studied. It's, it's really, it's been studied over the range of conditions you expect throughout the year. And it's nice to have that, that monitoring information. But as we, we click to the next slide where we reconfigure this feeder, there could be an event or a maintenance type of, of issue where now that, that DER that was being served from that blue substation is now a long distance away from a different substation that it might not have been studied on. So kind of having that awareness of what the DER is producing, especially in these abnormal configurations and how that might be affecting how close we're getting to system constraints is, is becoming increasingly important as, as DER is, is, um, is propagating across the, the system. Uh, next slide, please. And this can be be handled through a combination of monitoring and estimated DER output. And I think the industry is still really trying to strike a, a balance and figure out what what's the right role for estimation versus direct monitoring, which can be a little bit more expensive. But ultimately, having an understanding of how much DER is online at a given point in, in time is, is really, really important. Next slide, please. So now we're going to get into some of these smart inverter functions that are enabled by IEEE 1547 2018 on a broader basis. Some of these have been available in Hawaii and California for a number of, of years. Um, those states just needed to move faster than the rest of the country based on, on penetration levels. Um, next slide, please. So there are, are really kind of five main control functions that all DER will have moving forward once equipment that's certified to the standard is available. And a brief note on that, we're, we're sort of expecting that that may occur sometime around the first of the year for 2022, that there starts to become this, this widespread availability for, for this type of equipment. That equipment will have four of these reactive power control functions. So thinking back a few slides ago of that consuming 
reactive power, the VAR draw. There's kind of four different ways to do that, four different controls to, to do that. And then there's one on that reducing the, the energy production. We can only enable one reactive power mode at a time, but we can stack the the active power or the volt watt on top of that, and we'll we'll look at that in a in one of the the next slides here. Um, so next, please. We're going to look at the volt bar and the volt watt function out of that that list because these are really becoming the preferred functions for states that are adopting fifteen forty seven and smart inverter functions. It's not uniform that states are selecting these, but there does seem to be a trend emerging that these are the, the functions of, of the highest interest and perhaps the, the most benefit. Um, this first one is the volt var mode, which senses and reacts to grid voltage. And what we're looking at in on this, this chart here is on the, the vertical axis, we're looking at that reactive power. So the injection or absorption of that reactive power component. And that's a function of the horizontal axis, which is the system voltage. So there's a, a range called the dead band on this slide where nothing happens. If voltage is just a minor deviation away from the target that we're aiming for, the DER system does nothing. But as we move to the, the right side of the, the screen here, the right side of that chart, when the voltage gets higher, we try to counteract that voltage rise by gradually increasing the amount of reactive power that's consumed. And again, that reactive power is going in the opposite direction of the normal energy production. So you can think of the reactive power almost as forward power flow, whereas we're thinking of this reverse power flow from the DER itself. And that counteracting effect can have a meaningful impact on managing voltage of, of the system. So this is a really great function and it does it automatically, which is an improvement over the methods that utilities have been using for many years where you sort of pick a fixed approach and it's not kind of looking at what are the real time conditions on the system. Next slide, please. So a brief look at volt watt. And I tend to think of this as a soft shutdown when voltages get, get really high and it relates to abnormal system configurations, which we'll look at in the next slide. But first, let's just kind of um, describe what this function does. And so the chart that we're showing on the screen here now, on the, the vertical axis, this is the, the active power generation. So the watts, the, the part that the, the part of energy or power, I should say, that, that DER gets paid for or compensated through net metering or whatever type of compensation program there, there is. The, the active power, well, why don't I describe the, the horizontal axis first? That's, that's the voltage. So as you get further out to the right, the, the voltage is higher. And what this function is doing is for normal conditions, the DER just produces the, the power that it has available. So if it's a solar unit, it's going to produce as much power as it can from the sun. But if for some reason the voltage got to this very high level, it's going to start to gradually back off that production and sort of a soft shutdown type of, of approach. Next slide, please. So what, what we're, we're looking at here is an example of the application of the volt watt. We have a, a DER unit that's connected next to, uh, right next to a substation. That's a great location for DER generally, less impacts on the system. Well, if we click to the next slide, please. Let's assume that there's some sort of event on that substation, maybe an animal, a lightning strike, equipment failure. Next, please. That substation automatically is disconnected. Next. And now the DER is served from a different substation that's much further away. And this is likely a configuration that the, the DER wasn't studied in. And what the, the volt watt function can do, uh, next please, is it will, it will back off the, the power to some sort of level that is hopefully less of an impact on the, the system. So sort of that soft shutdown, 
allowing the DER to still try to produce as much power as possible, but in a configuration wasn't, wasn't studied for. So this function can sort of automatically back off the power in a way that, that helps integrate it in, into the system and allows for system flexibility to switch this DER into a bunch of different configurations without necessarily needing to do a detailed engineering study on all of those configurations. Uh, next, please. I mentioned that these functions can be stacked. And this is an approach that states are starting to take. And I think it's an effective one where under normal voltage conditions shown in green here, that volt var function is the primary response. And then once voltages get above the acceptable range and there are industry standards on sort of what that utilities need to keep voltage, the range that utilities need to keep voltage within, if voltage does start to exceed that range, then this other function that we just looked at, the volt watt can be used to start backing off the, the power production. If voltage gets too high, which we'll look at in a, a second here, um, in terms of abnormal conditions, the, the DER is going to shut down like it, like it sort of always has. Uh, there's a, a range that it just isn't necessarily required to operate within. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're going to transition. We were looking at the distribution system perspective and sort of what are the local impacts for the solar plant that's you know kind of in in the neighborhood level or the the rooftop unit. Th those are the types of impacts we're just looking at. And now we're transitioning into the transmission and bulk generation system. And the the bulk power system has a different perspective on what DER needs to do compared to the distribution system. Uh, the bulk system perspective is we want DER just to hang on as long as possible for most scenarios, continue to support the system by producing power, which can act as a, a buffer when events start to happen. On the distribution side, there's still kind of a general philosophy of trying to trip DER off quicker to coordinate with distribution system protection if something were to go wrong uh, with a, a DER not detecting that there was a system event. So there's there's this tension here where distribution, quicker tripping, concerned with voltage rise, the the bulk system saying, hang on as long as possible. We'd, we'd really like, like the support. And so there's discussions going on between uh, distribution utilities and ISOs, RTOs, or transmission operators of really how to strike that, that balance. Uh, next, please. So a, a number of regions have gone through this discussion of, of ride through, and this is specific to IEEE 1547 adoption. Um, California, for example, or Hawaii has have been implementing ride through for some time, but now we're starting to standardize ride through requirements over a broader swath of, of states. And what this is showing is PJM, ISO New England, MISO, how they've decided to really come up with a range of different philosophies and settings for how to approach the, striking this balance. And we're currently working with uh, New York ISO on and the distribution utilities there on, on this similar type of decision point. So this is a really important first kind of key decision that is needed for IEEE 1547 implementation of how to strike that balance. And it can be a longer type of discussion since there are people on the transmission side and distribution side and kind of come from different worlds. But we often recommend to start looking at this bulk system perspective quicker to determine really where these little dots should fall for your particular region. And it's best to try to coordinate these responses over as wide of a region as, as possible as well. And ISOs and RTOs where there are organized markets are a good mechanism for doing that. Um, next, please. So now just would like to sort of show some of the notable state activity. And this isn't comprehensive, but this is a, a, an accounting of some of the states that have started to look at IEEE 1547 implementation. 
um, Nehru passed a resolution about a, a year ago now, a little bit over a year ago, that recommended state commissions start really looking at this implementation and align these efforts with the availability of, of certified equipment. So I talked a little bit about how certified equipment may still be nine months to a, a year out, maybe even a little bit more. It's a good time to start having these discussions to get prepared for this equipment being available, but we still have a little bit of time before it's available, which I think works to everybody's benefit here. Um, next slide, please. And then this is just a table for reference on, on some of the activities that are in those highlighted states. Um, next, please. So now we're going to, to briefly touch on interoperability. And this is, again is sort of that communications information exchange. And if we go to the next slide, this gives the, the scope, um, and you can click next again, please, of really for the 1547 standard and what might be implemented in, in state state rules, it, it really just looks at the interface to the DER itself and all of the upstream network and whatever system it's communicating to isn't really in scope. But what it does do for us is it allows us to standardize on how to refer to these functions. So how you describe a function in the kind of technical jargon is, is an information model. And then the language that you use to describe that is sort of the communications protocols. So those, these are really important aspects of defining the interoperability aspects of, of smart inverters. Next slide, please. And the, the types of, of use cases that you might use interoperability for is the real-time monitoring that we were talking about. Um, if you need to do remote settings changes for some particular situation that uh, a utility finds themselves in, or these centralized control schemes like an advanced distribution management system, managing DER remotely um, is another use case. And within that one, kind of flexible interconnections or dynamically changing the amount of power production based on system conditions, which are changing dynamically is, is another type of use case. So there, there's, there are a lot more than this, but just wanted to give you a flavor for the types of use cases that interoperability unlocks. Uh, next, please. This is the, the ADMS example in a little bit more, more detail. We talked about the situational awareness and, and hidden load. There are also these kind of more advanced applications within the ADMS, FLIZR, which is fault locating, isolation service restoration, kind of the automated switching part of, of a, an ADMS system. And DER can impact the, the calculations there. So we need to, to integrate it within these types of systems. Also voltage regulation, if we're developing a conservation voltage reduction scheme or a centralized control scheme for, for voltage management, it's really important to think about coordinating the, the DER controls. And interoperability is, is a way to, to do this. I see a, a question on a poll. Yes, I think we had a, a poll question that would be be good to, to insert here. And so the, the question here that we'd, we'd like to uh, gauge from you all is to what, what extent has your state started planning for and integrating advanced DER controls? Let's take a minute to, so you can all respond to this question. All right, looks like the poll results are, are in and pretty good distribution across the, the different responses on um, with sort of the, the biggest response being, you know, not quite quite sure where the, the state is, is currently at with, with integrating DER 
controls and, and smart inverters. Thank you for, for those responses, that, that's interesting. And so I, I believe this is my final slide. I, I just wanted to, to mention this particular image isn't necessarily exactly how the systems will be architected, but there is this need to develop sort of architectures around how DER aggregators might interact with utility distributed energy resource <laughs> management systems, ADMS and SCADA systems, and cybersecurity is a pretty critical component of, of that as, as well. So this is sort of a future need that, that we can uh, just wanted to in include as an example. And with that, next, please. The, these are the takeaways that we started at with the top. So I won't necessarily go over those again in, in the interest of time. Next slide, please. Um, a few key questions that states can ask about DER integration. This again is a, a reference slide. And then one more reference slide on the next is um, some resources for, for more information. So just looking at the, the time, I think that's where we'll leave it for this presentation and uh, look forward to your, your questions. And uh, if you'd, you'd like to talk more, please do sign up for, for office hours. I'd be, be happy to, to try to answer any additional questions. Thank you. With that, I'll hand it back to Carrie. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dalton. Um, we will circle back with you for Q&A. Uh, at this time, I will um, would like to invite uh, the California Energy Commissioner, uh, Andrew McAllister, to provide a few minutes of remarks on how uh, the state is thinking about moving through some of these issues. Commissioner? Uh, great. Well, thanks, Carrie. Um, apologies for the confusion. This was on my calendar at 10, so uh, these things happen. <laughs> but uh, happy to be with you. Uh, really excited about this topic, actually. This has been, um, I think, a topic that's been on my uh, priority list, really, ever since I sat down at the Energy Commission in 2012. And um, the, the advances since then uh, have been tremendous. Uh, and I think it's dawning on uh, pretty much, um, I'd say, most, most if not all, um, regulators and uh, sort of the electric uh, cognoscenti that um, the DERs have to be part of the solution. And that's uh, broadly defined, right? That's buildings, um, it's generation supply, it's smart inverters that Patrick was just talking about, but it's load flexibility generally, it's storage at all scales, uh, and the digital age is enabling all these solutions. And so it's a super exciting time. Um, I wanted to just, uh, well, thank uh, uh, Mari and Weeb um, uh, for, uh, and Holly and the whole team, uh, and then at NASIO and Nehruk as well, um, for uh, marshalling this conversation. Uh, certainly, it's, uh, it's a timely one, as I said. Um, I did want to point out, I, I, uh, I just a few months ago stepped down as board chair of NASIO, uh, and there are a number of um, uh, collaborations going on between NASIO and Nehruk, uh, and certainly many of those have uh, um, uh, importance across the West, uh, and WEEB is also just a really great resource in, in this regard for these conversations. In particular, I wanted to just highlight the, uh, uh, collabor the task force that just wrapped up after two years of work uh, on comprehensive electric system planning, uh, and that was a, a joint NASIO um, a collaboration that involves uh, 16 states and produced a bunch of materials uh, that are relevant. And that actually early on, the thinking was, um, you know, as we were sort of uh, conceptualizing that effort, it really was about distribution system planning. Uh, and then as states, as, as other states started to chime in, well, what about, you know, what about uh, transmission? What about, you know, sort of um, uh, the, the range of supply options that we have, all the different planning challenges that we have and linking uh, distribution, you know, behind the meter even, all the way up to distribution and all the way up to the wholesale markets. And that it became clear that it needed to be a comprehensive discussion. But it started life as uh, kind of recognizing that distribution system was the piece that was being left out of planning uh, at the state level. Uh, and so uh, these kind, this conversation to really kind of make up for that and accelerate the distribution system planning conversation and, and put it in its rightful place, I think is, uh, is overdue and super welcome. And, and the time is, is very ripe. Uh, the ground is very fertile for that. Uh, so again, just wanted to um, highlight the importance of this conversation. Um, 
the uh, I was I was uh, uh, you know on the leadership of that um, of that joint effort between Nehru and Nazio and just saw its evolution in a super positive direction over the two years. Uh, so so a good resource. Um, you know we're seeing uh, in uh, California with last summer and Texas uh, as well. It's just so obvious that uh, energy efficiency and DERs broadly have to be a part of the solution. They must be a part of the solution uh, for increasing and improving reliability and really inoculating our systems uh, against uh, climate change. Um, so uh, we, we need to really get to that. Luckily, we have lots of tools and that we're in the digital age. Uh, we have amazing tools at our disposal. Patrick just uh, talked about some of them. Marianne will talk about others. I mean, these are two of the best people to be to be talking uh, about these topics. I've known Marianne uh, for since I guess uh, maybe 1991 or so, when I showed up as a as a green uh, former Peace Corps volunteer at Berkeley Lab, and have just learned so much from her over the years. Um, and and as uh, at the Energy Commission, you know, we we've, we've partnered with uh, with Berkeley Lab on on many many topics that are related to this. So. Uh, finally, I just wanted to mention uh, California, you know, sort of to wit of all this. Uh, we are, as a result, in part at least, of, the, um, of the, the root cause analysis that came out of the August challenges with the heat waves, August and September. Um, you know, revitalization of the demand response conversation is really uh, front and center in California. And that involves, uh, I mean, you know, it has to involve wherever you are, it has to involve the RTO and the Balancing Authority, the, the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, Public Service Commission, um, and then the planning agency, the State Energy Office. And so all of these entities have to be at the table here. At the Energy Commission, and together with the other agencies, with the PUC, uh, with the CPUC, and the, the California ISO, uh, we are collaborating on a, on a number of fronts. Uh, in particular, at the Energy Commission, we're leading efforts on load management standards, which is very exciting, uh, to help sort of create the infrastructure for uh, prices to devices kind of approaches. Um, and automation. Uh, Senate Bill 49 gave uh, the Energy Commission authority to incorporate into appliances low flexibility technology. So kind of along the lines of, uh, of the smart inverters that Patrick was just talking about, um, but uh, for a broad range of devices. Um, so it's a kind of a new authority that, that we're uh, sorting through right now. It's very exciting. So imagine you know, millions of devices that actually have native capacity for load flex. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a new direction we're heading in that's got great promise. And then in the building standards themselves, Title 24, uh, the building energy efficiency standards, you know, working to incorporate load flexible technologies into those as uh, you know, either voluntary or, or mandatory uh, requirements. And so uh, this will set the stage to really enable this kind of a resource uh, to be uh, load flexibility and demand response to be a, a grid resource at the distribution level, aggregatable and pushable up into the wholesale markets in some form or another. So all this is extremely exciting. So uh, all the states that are paying attention here and, and uh, all the attendees here in this class, I think uh, you know, are gonna get a, a solid taste for this and I think uh, emerge understanding how important this topic is and it's really vital. Uh, it's, it's the best thing for ratepayers. It's gonna uh, allow enhancement of grid, grid uh, reliability and decarbonization and cost, uh, cost uh, reductions as we electrify many of our end uses. So that's transportation and buildings uh, across the board. So we're gonna be using more electricity, but we're gonna be managing it much more intelligently and optimally. So these tools uh, that you're gonna learn about through this three-part series are uh, really along these lines, they're gonna be vital. So uh, with that, I kind of wanted to just give you a little bit of a taste for California where we're going, and then just uh, thank everyone for, uh, for attending and certainly uh, Weeb and partners for putting this series together. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you for laying the foundation for uh, why we're really um, talking about this today and why we uh, were training you all a few years ago in 2018 and uh, why we hope to continue our partnerships uh, so that we can deliver all of this great information. So thanks for everything that you're doing, Great, Krishna. Can I, can I say one other thing <laughs> uh, before we pass to Mary Ann, who I see is right there. Um, I neglected to say that, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Jenea Scott was the representative uh, from uh, California to the WEAV up until recently. She uh, was just appointed to be a senior advisor for the new secretary of, well, the, the, now, the, the in process to be confirmed uh, secretary of interior. So I've stepped into her large shoes and I'll be uh, working with WEAV as the representative from California 
uh, going forward. So I just wanted to make sure people people knew that. So happy to be uh, participating more integrally in uh, in all the web activities. It's, they're very vital. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the update. Great. Okay. Um, we are back on uh, the normal schedule, and we are uh, now hearing from. Mary Ann Piet from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and she will be discussing demand flexibility technology, new programs, and emerging policies, and how you can really take what Patrick just said and, and think about it uh, for your distribution grid. So, uh, uh, Ms. Piet, go ahead. Thanks. So, Carrie, just you want me to finish by say quarter past? Uh, yes, that would be that'd be good. Okay. Yeah, just want to make sure. I'm have time for Q&A. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead to the next slide. So I uh, want to thank Nayrook and Lisa and DOE and Nazio and others for um, inviting me to participate in today's event. I'm really excited to talk with you about Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings. We're about to publish a report from the Building Technologies Office on a roadmap for Grid Interactive Efficient Buildings that's going to include things that you all can do to facilitate the use of buildings as a flexible resource in your, around the country in your, in your regions. I'm gonna be talking about the use of automation and how utility programs are using automation. I'm quite familiar with the California programs, but if questions come up, I'm familiar with some of the work in Hawaii and other states. I'll talk about open standards, and that's a, a big part of my talk is to familiarize you with the way these standards work how they're similar, how they're different. And then to give you some details about some of the materials that Andrew McAllister just introduced to you about the load management standards in California, something called SB49 and uh, the digital price server that the California Energy Commission is developing. And then where we're headed, because this is a really exciting time. We're developing the technology using the internet and other communication systems to be able to continuously communicate with devices and buildings. And uh, we're really excited to, to present this to you today. Go ahead to the next slide. So many of you may have seen a slide like this before. The basic history and demand side management is energy efficiency. And energy efficiency is about using less energy, less energy all the time, less energy anytime. Um, and we're moving away from not just using less energy, understanding when we use the energy. And I'm mostly gonna be talking about electricity. So we have these terms of load shed and load shift. Load shed is your traditional hot summer demand response. And those tend to be events. They may be one hour, they may be four hours, they may be six or eight hours, but those are event-based activities. Load shift is something that's emerging. And load shift is a big challenge today because we don't have a lot of it in the market. And we'll talk a little about using prices for load shifting, but the basic idea is actually to be able to take load at part of the day and reduce it at another part of the day. So it's moving load. And that load may or may not increase the total energy. So sometimes if we can shift load to a cleaner time of the day and take a little more one time, use a little less in another, the total GHG Greenhouse gases may be down, even though energy use might be up. Modulate is the term that we use for fast response. And in the California terms, we use the terms shape, shift, shed, and shimmy. And modulate is like our shimmy resource, uh, where we're fast acting loads, five minute or one minute response, ancillary surface types. And then generation, which is not in one of the pictures, but that's the concept of a building being a prosumer or being able to supply its own energy with a photovoltaic or a fuel cell or even CHP. So there's these terms are um, important as we think about the policy constructs to enable the buildings and industrial loads to be part of our flexible uh, grid of the future. Go ahead to the next slide. So really quickly, the concepts of what I just said are starting with efficient components. We really wanna understand HVAC, lighting, facades, plug loads, and go to the next slide. And then how you control these as a whole building system. So a lot of us are very interested in whole building retrofits. Go ahead to the next slide. And this next one is how these systems fit together and how either an individual device or the whole building is communicating with some sort of grid signal. Okay, go ahead to the next slide, please. 
So I wanna give you a quick overview of some of the programs in California. California had something called bifurcation years ago. We have load modifying programs that are primarily communicated to customers with pricing signals, something like critical peak pricing or real-time pricing. And we've been having a series of conversations with the utilities in California about more RTP. So the concept is if the price is high, can we automate the load to go into some sort of different mode when prices are high? The SoCal Edison RTP is a temperature triggered RTP. So you can see it's triggered on the temperature in downtown Los Angeles. CPP overall is triggered on temperature. So, so it's a day ahead program and there's a, uh, some sort of emergency system conditions as well. Now the supply side demand response programs in California are those that are bid directly into the CAISO wholesale market, capacity bidding, the base interruptible program is of course an emergency response, and then some, something called summer discount, which is direct load control. Now you'll see there's manual and automation, and I'm gonna introduce you into some of the automation data. Uh, the automation data have been a, a lot with the uh, large CNI programs, um, and we're beginning to see some of this open ADR technology used in the in the smaller residential as well. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, three standards I'm going to talk about. Um, the first one is open ADR. I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, details on that one. The second one is CTA 2045. Uh, and the third one is SCP IEEE 2030.5. A little bit about the history of each. All of these have started around the same time, which, which many of you uh, may not know. About almost 20 years ago, um, open ADR was funded by the California Energy Commission. And, and uh, we at LBL been working on that for almost two decades. And it, we developed a as language of grid signals. So open ADR, I'll, I'll go through it in a moment, is basically a software application um, between utility and the buildings. CTA 2045 is different. CTA 2045 is a hardware and software component. The other two are software. CTA 2045 um, was actually uh, conceived by uh, a researcher in California who had the idea for something called USNAP, which was like a, a port a physical port that would also have communication. And uh, the, the state's been working on that um, for, for, as I said, sort of two decades now. SCP-2 um, was the newer version of the Zigbee SCP-1, which was part of the Zigbee radios and advanced meters. And that one is tending to be used more with Rule 21 and inverter control, but it also has messages that can be used for prices to devices. And when you think about these standards, you can think a little about a, a Mac operating system or a PC operating system and the need to have a variety of different ways that we communicate. There doesn't have to be a single one. There can be a few and, and there's, there's pros and cons. There's no perfect standard out there, but these are some of the uh, most common standards in use today. Go ahead to the next slide. A little bit about open ADR. Open ADR is a, a server and that's what we call the top node and then an end node, which is at the building and we put in the end node normally with retrofit gateways. So the Open ADR Alliance now has 160 different members that are supporting it. On the bottom there, you'll see uh, the pricing data models. So an, an integer price can be translated into an Open ADR signal, and we tend to use the internet. It doesn't have to be the internet. We're also using FM broadcast to send these signals. So the building is pre-programmed to do something. The most common thing we do is to reset the zone temperature. So in large buildings, it's very common that you know, the building may be operating at 70 and we let it go up to 74 or 75 for a couple hours. And we have a thousand of the target retail stores across the United States use open ADR and work with their rooftop units. So in some parts of the market, big box retail, um, there's a fair amount of uptake of this standard. Go ahead to the next slide. Now, cloud interface, I wanna make sure you understand the differences. Open ADR, when, when we first developed it for CNI buildings, we were focused on uh, large, because the Zigbee was, was really the, uh, the, the protocol of choice for uh, SCP-1 with smart meters and residential. But at this time, open ADR is also being used in homes and in smart devices because the technology can go from a utility cloud to a vendor cloud. So it may go to 
an Ecobee cloud or a Nest cloud. And the cloud interface is very important because the kind of technology that we're using for a large CNI site where we have a gateway receiving the, the uh, technology and signals directly is very different from the vendor clouds that we see in residential. So that's an emerging capability. A lot of uh, uh, smart home devices are capable of receiving open ADR signals. Go ahead to the next slide. A CTA 2045 by contrast is a physical port uh, and there's a picture there of a water heater. We've seen the most uptake of CTA 2045 uh, and CTA is the Commuter Technology Association, Consumer Technology Association. Uh, and you'll see a physical port, but then a variety of protocols. So the CTA 2045 can actually read it can get a Wi-Fi signal, it can get an open ADR signal, it can get an SEP signal. So it's multi-protocol, the software side, and it's got a physical port. So you can, you can retrofit a device or you can get an EV charger or a water heater or a pool pump that has CT8045 available on it. It tends to be for individual devices. Open ADR historically has tended to be uh, for larger systems like the energy management system or lighting controls at the commercial CNI. But there's some areas where they have both. So you have CTA 2485 with open ADR and it's quite a powerful um, uh, package. Now, when you get to whole building controls like a, like a SHEMS, a smart home energy management system, um, we, haven't, we have a challenge on the architecture for the devices to be integrated. And that's where there's a lot of research still needed. Go ahead to the next slide. Now this, I, I did see one typo here, a couple typos actually, but this is a quick look at around the country where we're starting to see the requirements for CTA 2045 and the requirements for open ADR. So in Washington and Oregon, there's been a lot of look at electric water heaters and those are both resistance and heat pump water heaters. So the, it, the heat pump water heater is a great example of a technology that's both efficient and flexible whereas a resistance water heater may be flexible, but not necessarily efficient. So it's one of those policy challenges on um, what do we do in the water heating space? But we have, if we have storage with a heat pump water heater and connectivity, that's a very powerful device. Energy Star is um, having new requirements around uh, connected devices and the use of open ADR. There's work on water heaters with Energy Star, uh, HRI 1380 and HR 1430. Uh, we have a variety of standards that are coming out for HVAC systems that have CTA 2045 and or open ADR. In California, we Title 24 has had open ADR requirements for large commercial buildings for several years in commercial HVAC. And there's also new something called JA13 that has some requirements for CTA 2045 and water heating. So there's a variety of these um, uh, requirements around the country. And uh, let's go ahead to the next slide. Now I wanna talk a little about the use of open ADR in commercial and industrial facilities in California. Over the last 10 years, uh, this is a summary of some of the incentives that have been paid out to buildings. So several hundred megawatts have been so automation for several hundred megawatts have been installed through utility programs. So these are investor owned programs. And you'll see on the left, it says customer paid and vendor paid. So several hundred customers, several hundred megawatts and several hundred thousand service accounts. And we've been collecting data on how the programs have changed over time. So the report that's listed here on automated demand response, non-residential incentive structure research project, took a look at what are the trends have been in the payments. California utilities have been paying a couple hundred dollars per kilowatt to pay for an audit, a review of the flexibility technology strategies, a review of automation, and installation of the automation to enable the buildings to be enrolled in some of the DR programs that I mentioned earlier. So we've been paying those incentives to allow that kind of technology to be integrated. Go ahead to the next slide. This slide shows you the performance of different strategies 
Now I, I, I have lighting all the way on the left and general on the right. And what you'll see is the estimate, the, the, the y-axis is the estimate of the performance in the field from the mean event performance compared to the initial estimate. And the initial estimate was generated when the audit was done. So the lighting systems have performed better than the initial estimates. Uh, some of the HVAC have not done as well. And as you know, uh, there are big challenges in baselines when we look at uh, the performance of an HVAC load shape and compared to an individual estimate, they haven't performed as well on average, but still we're getting a pretty good capability. So there's a variety of different kinds of um, facilities here. In California, these incentives have gone out to commercial buildings. They've gone out to agricultural pumping. They've gone out to industrial control systems. And uh, we're starting to look at, again, what is the performance of the different end uses? When we think about HVAC, we look at the last 10 days for the baseline, and it may be that the event day is warmer than the last 10 days. And we try to account for those in a, in a morning adjustment in the baseline, but then sometimes you have to shed load just to break even. And so for HVAC, that those uh, baselines are still a challenge. Go ahead to the next slide. So I'm gonna to transition to my last few slides around the California uh, Senate Bill 49, which is applying standards in the state water project assessment. I have three bullets here that explain the scope of it. I'm not talking here about the water part, although that is in the title of it, but the concept is that California is trying to explore the feasibility of requiring that appliances have the capability to be able to have flexible load. So the efficiency standards are we, we want to manage energy loads to improve the grid reliability. And the CEC is looking at the requirement to require uh, demand flexibility and prioritize appliances that have some capability to receive signals and provide flexible load. So the CEC is working with the PUC and the IOUs to consider what is going to be required to incentivize demand appliances. Go ahead to the next slide. Now, this one is a really exciting uh, concept here. And the idea is California is going to require uh, digital prices, digital tariffs. So every the vision, the long-term vision is that every tariff in the state is communicated in a, in a digital format. And the utilities are interested in looking at how we can use open ADR and some of the features in that standard to represent the, dig, the, the integers associated with the tariff. So we care a lot about the shape of the tariff. It could be a time of use tariff. It could be a critical peak price tariff. It could be an RTP tariff. And the second element of this is looking at the watt time signal and the greenhouse gases. So we wanna be able, if a customer wants to listen to uh, how clean the electricity is and control their devices to minimize the greenhouse gases associated with their consumption. So that we are in the process in California of looking at uh, the automation technology required for this kind of system. And you'll see a list there, smart plugs, thermostats, energy management systems, EVs, batteries, water heaters, e refrigeration. So this is a, an effort that's underway and Andrew's leadership, Commissioner McAllister's leadership has been a driving force in um, moving towards this prices to devices capability in California. Go ahead to the next slide. The, um, the load management standards are actually an open order institute rulemaking. And the Public Utilities Commission, of course, regulates the IOUs, but this rulemaking in California also is influencing the municipal utilities and all the community choice aggregators. So this requirement that California requires that the utilities publish their tariffs in a digital form uh, is for all uh, energy service providers. And uh, this technology uh, is supposed to be potentially in real time in the future. So if you're getting an RTP signal, 
you'd get it continuously. Now, it may be that you have a day ahead price. So, so at three o'clock uh, on Monday, you get 24 prices that, that give you the hourly price for the entire day. And that's kind of a rolling thing. And the concept is then you could schedule your, your heat pump water heater to charge before the high price time. And you could schedule your dishwasher not to come on until the price is low. Some of that may be manual that you let people see the price uh, and they could get an, a, a smartphone app. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in creating the underlying infrastructure to allow this to be happening. Go ahead to the next slide. I am happy to say that we've been negotiating with the California Energy Commission for something called the CalFlex Hub. The California Load Flexibility Research and Deployment Hub is an epic solicitation that LBNL had won the notice of proposed award and we're currently uh, negotiating. We have a series of partners from around the state uh, and a set of technology projects, as well as partnering with the state on creating the infrastructure to test the ability to send out different kinds of prices. So we're working on valuing the load flexibility, prioritizing which technologies are the most promising to be able to receive a signal and respond to it, and creating uh, both what's called low TRL or sort of more science, more new technologies that aren't quite on the market yet, and technologies that are on the market that we can work with some of the vendors to, to modify the software for them to be, get this continuous price signal. Demand response today is still hot summer events, and we are looking towards trying to move it into an 8760 every hour a year opportunity. Of course, this matters a lot in the spring in California when we have our duck curve problem. And if we can use more electricity in the middle of the day and less around dinner type, we can flatten that duck and we can understand how to invest in the technologies. We also have a disadvantaged community theme here. So we wanna make sure that we're getting the technology out to our customers and working with these communities that may be uh, concerned about this time varying electricity prices. One of the things that we're doing there is using FM signals. So the concept of an FM signal is that a radio uh, can be put with a device and we can get those prices broadcast to devices and not uh, this two-way. Open ADR at this time is a two-way system, but we can also broadcast prices and we want to look at being able to get to um, more rural and remote uh, sites that may not have the internet or somebody may not have Wi-Fi at their home. So we're gonna create technology to try to get these prices distributed more broadly. Go ahead to the next slide. This is my final slide. And I want to just remind everybody that uh, there's a lot of work going on in these different standards. And it's a, an exciting time because we've been working on these concepts for, for many years now. And the, the, the manufacturers and the service providers are starting to understand that this is um, a very cost-effective technology investment because the uh, devices themselves are getting much smarter. Some people want you know, a communicating refrigerator that can tell them what kind of groceries they need or um, have some other smart uh, devices on them. So we're starting to see these kinds of things in homes. But of course, those tend to be the high income homes. We are looking at, I reviewed for you that many states are requiring communication on their devices and California is making a very um, direct investment in the use of digital tariffs. I mentioned the need for cost benefit data. <clears throat> and one of the issues is, do we have persistence of savings? Uh, in that study from Energy Solutions about the ADR incentives in California, there's some data on the persistence of savings and many of the customers would participate for three or four years, but will they participate for 10 years? So when we make these investments in this technology, what is the lifetime of a gateway or a smart device? And that's a real important issue in the cost benefit analysis is how many years does this communicating device communicate? And are the programs stable enough that people will invest in the infrastructure? So we've seen a lot of change in the way the programs are structured 
and that makes it confusing to customers. So we need simple enrollment methods. I think I have one more slide. This is just some of the questions. Go ahead to the very last one. Some of the questions that states can ask. Um, it's really important to understand whether utilities are thinking about the steps towards promoting interoperability in, in demand flexible loads. What kind of automation standards do they want to invest in? How can we work with the state on the building codes and state load management standards like California is trying to do? And how do we think about planning or proposing grid monetization efforts to integrate flexible loads? Because the majority of the load out there is with buildings, about 70% of the electricity use in California, in the United States is buildings. And we want to really um, enable those loads to be flexible so those peak loads don't really dominate the, the uh, sizing. So we have a poll here. Um, does your state consider buildings as a grid resource? So we'll take a moment for you to fill that poll out and uh, look forward to your thoughts. I'll stop right there. Great, thanks so much.